trust you, God. I trust you've worked it all out. Worked all things out. Good morning, church. We're so excited that you joined us this morning at IPC Church Online. We hope that this hour will be a wonderful one and that you'll he- feel God's presence. And we pray that this will be a great lead into your week and that each day this week you'll feel God's love and you'll feel his power in many wonderful ways. This Sunday marks another episode of Pastor Chris's um, sermon series called Church, Why Bother? We hope that you'll find it challenging and that you'll learn so much from it. If you're a family with children or youth at your home, we have programs for you. Follow our Facebook or our YouTube page for links there. We hope that they'll have a wonderful time learning as well. After the service today, we we will not be having virtual coffee. Instead, we'll have Pastor Chris and the elders join us in a listening session. They would love to hear your thoughts on the many changes that are happening in our church. It'll be a wonderful time to have your voice heard. In order to engage in the meeting, we ask that you pre-register. You can join the email. There will be a link there for pre-registration that you received yesterday. Or you can log on to our IPC app and you'll find the link there to register. After you've pre-registered, you'll get all the information to join the Zoom meeting. So we encourage you to enjoy that and to join in this Sunday right after the service at 11.15 or tomorrow, Monday at 7 o'clock. We'd love to have you there. So let's join together and worship with the kids. Come on, church. To think about the goodness of the Lord He gives me everything I need and so much more So I just want to lift my hands And say that I love Him I just want to lift my heart in prayer me everything I needed so much more so I just want to lift my hands and say that I love him I just want to lift my heart in
Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained My orphan heart was given me My morning grew quiet and my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me new, now life begins with you It's your endless love pouring down forever 
This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony.
in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Oh, all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. I want to remind everybody that uh, after uh, the service this morning at 11.15, we're having a listening session, essentially. And then if you aren't able to make that one, we would invite you to one uh, tomorrow night, Monday night at 7 o'clock. Uh, we are wanting as elders to listen to this congregation. Uh, this year upcoming may require us to make some interesting decisions about our future as a church. And uh, the, the next step in the process, according to the, the design, the plan that the elders have put in place, is to listen. Uh, what we would really want is just to know what's in your, on your heart, in your mind, about what you think we should do going forward. So we would invite everybody in the congregation either to participate today or tomorrow night. Also, uh, this can be done in life groups. We'd provide an elder to, par to, to participate with you, to join you, if you wish to do it that way, so that they can hear We'll have elders in uh, small groups online, uh, breakout rooms on Zoom, uh, in, on the, in the two online meetings. So if you could come, we'd really appreciate it. If you could participate, uh, that would be fantastic. Uh, uh, they hopefully will be no more than an hour. That's our intention. But we're seeking God's will, to know the mind of God, to know the leading of God. And we really believe one way we can do that is to listen to you. So this is about our future, and here's your chance to contribute to say what you think and what you, what, what you want for our future, what you think we maybe should be doing as we go forward. So please participate. Today, 11.15, tomorrow night, Monday, 7 o'clock, or in your life groups. Thank you. Well, let's ask God to really speak now into our lives, um, just keeping us moving forward as we follow Christ. Let's pray. Lord, it's, uh, it's exciting to be able to think about the church as the church. And Lord, even though we're all listening from homes, Lord, we're still, we're still the church of Christ. And Lord, we want to do this well. We want to do it in a way that you call us to, in a way that uh, can be life-transforming for ourselves and for many other people. So speak to us now from your word again, Lord, and uh, make an impression. Reveal truth. Help us to think your thoughts after you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I hope it's becoming clear as we make our way through this series, Church, uh, Why Bother? 
that the series is essentially about two things. Number one, that uh, th there is an absolute need for Christ followers to be involved in the church. It's God's design for us. He created it. It's his will for us. Uh, it's the means by which he intends to accomplish his purposes in our lives. It's what God wants. Uh, there's no walking away from it. There's no feeling that this isn't necessary, no matter what the experience of it might be at any given point. This is God's will. Secondly, we're all called to a deeper involvement in the church than many people experience. You know, going through the, the process and, and digging into Scripture and unpacking what the church is called to be, what the church actually is, just reveals this to us. You know, last week we talked about confessing sin to one another, you know, and, and, and maybe diving a little deeper into that dynamic. We talked about the powerful experience, potentially, of worship and of the Lord's Supper and what that can mean for us. We talked about engaging the dynamic of sp spiritual leadership and accountability, all these things that, that make up what church is, if you would. Uh, it, we could all move further in. And, and we engage it and it becomes a reality in our lives as opposed to standing back and really limiting our involvement in it, lim limiting what it means for us. So today I want to engage another component, uh, an important one, about, uh, about what it means to be in the church, to engage it, to experience it fully. And you know, right off the top, I have a real reluctance to tell you what I want to talk about using the typical word. Uh, that this is referred to because I think as soon as I mention it it'll shut people down P other people will think well I know all about it other people will think well that's boring I don't think I want to listen particularly today but I want to suggest that this something properly understood uh, is 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 not uh, something that a lot of people really engage and as a matter of fact they might not even fully understand it from the Bible's perspective so I'm not going to tell you what it is right away but what I am going to do is describe to you the Greek word that underlines it. Um, this is a really interesting word. Uh, it's made up of two words that are put together to create one Greek word. The interesting thing about this word is that the first word of the two comes from Hebrew, and the second word of the two comes from Greek. The first word, the Hebrew word, that, that is, is uh, kind of at the root of, of this concept, has the meaning of shared house. Literally, that's the most literal translation. A shared house which binds people together and which produces companionship. The second word, the Greek word, that is brought together with the first producing the word we're going to think about today, is, is that Greek word, and it means common. And it has connotations of bonding or closeness. So shared house and commonness which produce bonding and closeness. Are you beginning to see maybe... Uh, the, the dynamic that I'm beginning to, s to describe? Well, this Greek word is koinonia, and it's a word that's translated in various ways, participation in life together, sharing life together, communion sometimes is the English translation of koinonia, but most often the English translation is fellowship. Now, there's the word I, I don't want you to allow to shut you down and turn you off. I want you to think and I want you to process what I have to say to you because I really believe with all of my heart many of us need to go more fully into fellowship. We need to understand it more. We need to engage it more. We need, need to come to a place where we exercise this dynamic of doing life together, this idea of sharing life, this idea of participating in life in a way that God calls us to but that very often we don't. I'm going to read a passage to you uh, that uh, essentially references uh, koinonia. It's, it's, it comes pretty early in the text, and it's translated fellowship. But then the text goes beyond that to describe the early church and how it experienced koinonia, shared house and binding together and so forth in commonality. Um, I want you to notice as I read how many times the, words, uh, the word Fellowship or share or shared or togetherness or common are in this text because they're all referencing koinonia. They're all speaking of the fact of, of what I'm describing here today. So I'm going to read this well-known passage, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. It says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. 
They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now I want to suggest to you there are eight words in that English translation of the passage that I've read to you in six verses which reference how people are, were engaging life together, how they were doing life together, how they were sharing life. Uh, and it's something that we can try to unpack today and then emulate in our own context. Just before I, I speak to their experience and bring some application, I want to I teach you something. And, and this is regarding the foundational reality of fellowship among us, about shared life, about commonality, about, about all these things that uh, have been described. Uh, you see, fellowship scripture, this togetherness in life, biblically is rooted first and foremost in the life of God. It's rooted in God, not in us. Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have lived together. They have shared life together. They have participated in what they have done together. They have known deep love and fellowship together in the Trinity for all eternity. This is, this is the nature of who they are. And you know, when we come to Christ, it says that we are in Christ. And it says because uh, uh, we are in Christ, we in some spiritual way enter into that dynamic of the Godhead. And, and I want to tell you, it is our, in our connection with Jesus that we are then united not only with God, but to one another. It's, it's almost like it's an objective reality, this fellowship that we share, this, this togetherness that we have that exists beyond us, if you would. It's just there because it's formed in Christ. You see, this is as opposed to individual people like you and me who might choose to participate in fellowship activities if we feel like it at any given moment. You see, the reality is it's already there because we are united in Jesus. We all share faith in Christ, if we indeed we have come to that place. Uh, that faith guides and govern our, governs our lives. We're all filled by God's Holy Spirit. We're united by that. You know, we share that together. You know, we have one baptism, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Paul writes in Ephesians, because we each are united to Jesus, all of a sudden we are united together as a result. Let me read to you 1 John chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. It says this, the life appeared, that's a reference to Christ. We have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. See, there it is. Our fellowship is rooted in God. And it then needs to be expressed in our experience. So, you know, it, it doesn't really matter if, if we're all, uh, you know, similar in terms of personality. We might have very different personalities. We're still all united in Christ. It might, it might not be that we all even like each other and want to necessarily hang out with one another. But we're still united in Christ. It might be that it, there are times of conflict that kind of come and go in the life of the church. It doesn't matter if we're mad at each other. We're still united in Jesus. That's why the Lord goes to such lengths to say, work out your differences and find unity again and reconciliation where you can because we need to reflect this fellowship, this shared life, this togetherness that we have in God. See, we are united by a common faith in Christ. So how did this first century church experience this? How did they live it out? How did they do life together, if you would? How did they have this common union in Jesus that formed their lives? Well, number one, it says that they were devoted to the same things. That they came to a place where they shared priorities as the people of God. It united them. They defined them and what those were. Uh, number one, the apostles' teaching, uh, fellowship, uh, the, the idea of relationship and, and living out what the bond that God had created. Um, they ate together, including the Lord's Supper, and they had prayer is a priority. So they had these four priorities. They had these, these four um, focuses which they, they, they allowed their life as a church to revolve around. And I can't imagine 
that they were devoted to these things without probably teaching from the apostles to begin with, but then also them deciding together, this is what we will be devoted to. These things are the things that will be common among us. These are the things that will be our priority. Now, uh, big, good question is, you know, IPC, are these our priorities? You know, it's so important. The, the apostles' teaching, let's dig in just briefly with each of these. I hope right now you're experiencing the apostles' teaching. Now, I'm no apostle, but I'm trying to take what they wrote and teach it to you so that you would understand how the kingdom of God works. These people were eager to know that. They wanted to know more, what it meant to follow Jesus. When Jesus was coming back, what he wanted them to do now, and on and on and on. So critical to them. Uh, and, and, and this drew them together. They had this fellowship. They had this sense of this is what we want to know together. And we want to live it out. And then fellowship, you know, Deep, loving, committed relationships. We'll talk about that more as we go forward. Um, the, they, the, the whole idea of um, uh, the, the, uh, um, the, the eating together in each other's homes. I mean, they were living together, if you would, in a sense. They were sharing each other's life in a very personal and, and intimate way. And, and they, were, they were in that place where they would pray together in a, in a, in a significant fashion. You see, my friends, they shared these priorities and they gave themselves to it in, un in unity and in agreement with one another. They shared life together in this way. It governed how they lived. Well, then they met together a lot, the text says, and um, this is distinguished from worship, which we'll come to in a minute, but they shared everything uh, th they had, even to the point of selling property and possessions in order to meet the needs of people in the church who were in need. Now, that's, that's a, an incredible thing that they did. And I'm going to ask you a question, just to bring application to our, our context, um, which is sort of, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's the kind of question that I want you to, to grapple with to see if indeed and how this might apply to our context. But have you ever sold property or any of your possessions in order to meet the need of someone in our congregation? the congregation that you participate in, if you're listening from elsewhere. You see, the point is that these people cared for one another to that extent that they were willing to sacrifice significantly, even dramatically, in order to make sure that the needs of the other w w w the th were met. And, you know, we're talking here about, about um, financial needs. What about other needs? in our congregation. What happens when you recognize that someone in our church has an emotional need and they're really struggling? What do you do with that? What, what if it's, a, it's an, a relational need? There's a real struggle between relationships or in a marriage or whatever it might be. What do we do with these things? You see, what, what is described to us here is that when certain individuals who ultimately sold property or possessions in order to meet a need, when they recognized the need, they did whatever was required in order to move toward that person to provide for the needs of that individual. The last thing that they would ever have done is to stand back and say, you know, that's not something that I want to engage. The last thing that they would have done was just to say, well, that person's got to deal with his problems. I'm not going to engage. I'm not going to be part of. I'm not going to participate in. I'm just going to leave it alone. See, my friends, what we have here are people who are committed to one another, who care deeply for one another, who are ready to act sacrificially to bless one another. So here's the question. Not only are we ready to meet one another's needs, are we even aware of one another's needs? See, sometimes churches function in the way that we close ourselves off to one another. That's not fellowship. That's the opposite. And we don't tell each other what our needs are. <laughs> How can we carry one another's burdens, bear one another's burdens if we don't know what those burdens are? And, and what I'm getting to here already, we're beginning to define what church is. It's a group of people who love one another, who are united together by Jesus, who care deeply and who are willing, first of all, to sacrifice for one another. Now this instance, this instance is financial. Let me read 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 5 for you. It's another similar instance uh, in, in a different context. It says this. Now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability entirely on their own. 
They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then, by the will of God, also to us. See, my friends, can you hear the love in that, that this Macedonian church had for others who were in desperate need? They were living in poverty, and they gave beyond what they were able to give. They sacrificed in order to bless because they knew the need was present. I say to you, IPC, we got to be a church where we know each other's needs, where we're open about them, and where we're ready to love sacrificially for the sake of the other. That is fellowship. That is shared life together. That is participating in life together. That is what God is calling us to. Well, it it goes on in in verse 46. It talks about how they worship together each day in the temple courts. Um, You know, worship is a central act of, of the church. It, it, it is central to who we are because there we come together. Each of us ready to, to honor God, but we come together as one. And we lift God up. We praise him in song and we, we honor him with our minds and we're ready not only to, to hear his voice but to obey it. You see, we're recognizing God as the worthy one, the one who is above all in our minds and in our lives. And we do it together. It's not like they're a bunch of individuals who are each having their own worship experience with God. No, we are a unity. We are a fellowship. We are a body that is sharing this love for God and this passion to adore him and to recognize his worth in our lives. What a powerful thing these people did. And that unites us. It expresses our union in Christ. And then that says they... And they went into each other's homes and they shared meals with gladness and great joy. This is a really interesting one. Gladness and great joy. There was a a major, uh, I want to call it an evaluative tool that was developed probably 20 years ago. And it, and it, it existed so that churches could use it. We did it a long time ago to see how healthy we were doing. I think there were eight categories and you would score high, of course, in some and low in others and you would then go forward and and deal with the issues that it produced. But one of the critical questions of that evaluative method was to ask the people of the church, and we all fill out surveys, how often each person had been in the home of another church member, participant, within the last week. The idea being this, the more people could say, yes, I have been in the home of another believer this week, uh, the, 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 the better the church was functioning, the more biblical the church was, the deeper the spirituality of the congregation, the deeper the fellowship. And the less people could say, well, no, it's, it's not every week, it's not even every month, maybe once a year, which is, you know, probably too common in so many congregations the less biblical and less, uh, less fellowship was actually taking place. It was a marker. And these people met together repeatedly, often in each other's homes. And they did so with gladness. And they did so with joy. And they ate together. Now, you probably are aware of how significant eating together in the Jewish context was. It was really sharing your life. It was opening up your life, your heart, your home to someone and, and welcoming them in as a friend. You know, I would suggest today it's not that much different. There are differences. It doesn't always mean the same thing to us. But I think if we are going into each other's homes, if we are sharing life together, if we're encountering one another over, over a meal and, and sharing our lives and talking about our faith and our, our, our kids and our, you know, our jobs, and so, if we are sharing life over a meal, it says something that's profound. This is fellowship. See, this is, if you would, commitment to each other. This is love for one another. This is a desire to be together with one another. This is what God wants for us. You see, it's no wonder that Acts uh, 2 says, uh, last verse, that the Lord added daily to their number. You know what the New Living Translation says? It's the Lord added daily to their fellowship those who were being saved. Because you see, people looked at these people who so loved one another and shared life together. And, su- and provided for one another and cared for one another. My goodness, these people wanted to be part of what was going on. They saw a dynamic at work and they wanted to enter in. 
See, what I'm saying to you today, I think, and, and, and maybe this is going to be really helpful. I, I hope it is. So many people hold a vision of a church, an understanding of a church. It is institutional, if you would. It's a building on a corner. It's something you go to and, and participate in once a week, and then you leave. But it's none of what I'm describing to you. Shared priorities. The apostles' teaching and, and fellowship and, 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 and breaking bread, the Lord's Supper, and, and prayer. You know, it, it isn't this, this dynamic of meeting to worship and caring for one another and going to into, into each other's homes. It isn't sharing life in that fashion. It is a matter of, in too many instances, and I hope it's not in your life, and I hope it's not a big part of our congregation's life, but people go to an event on a Sunday morning, and they might enjoy it, but they stand back and they distance themselves from anything else. Put on a show for me. Let me hear a good sermon. Let me hear good music. But relationship, connection to people, commitment to one another, deep love for other people who form this thing called the church? No, thank you. But I want to tell you, my friends, that's not the biblical understanding of church. I can describe to you the biblical understanding of church by, by saying, you know, and there's more to it than this, but the reality is that when we can grasp fellowship, we're, we're coming to a place where we begin to understand what the church is supposed to be. When we, when we grasp this concept of sharing our lives together and caring for one another and being committed to one another, going to each other's homes, meeting each other's needs, that's church. It's this, it's this it's, you can call it an organization, but it's really people who come together in commitment to God and commitment to one another, and they do life together in a way that honors God and blesses the world. See, there's no place, if you would, for arm's length Christianity if you want to be part of a biblical New Testament church. Now, I do know people, and this is, you know, it's not uncommon, I, I suppose, that people have said some of these things to me. People say, you know, I, I really like what happens at IP in a, IPC on a Sunday morning. You know, and compliment preaching maybe or the music and so forth. But all this relationship stuff, this community stuff, I really don't want it. And people are sincere, they're being honest, and I appreciated that. But they're saying they don't want to engage what the Bible calls church. I have other people, and an interesting slant on this, and, and they've said to me, you know, I'm done with church. I have a group of friends, they're all believers, that's my church. Well, what do you think of that? Is that church? Well, I would suggest to you actually no. Uh, because... Unless there's worship, unless there are the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism, unless there is the dynamic of accountability, it, unless there are elders appointed to be the spiritual leadership of a church, and so on and so on, it's not church. It's just like a little slice of a pie. But church is so much more than getting together and enjoying one another, and even praying together, maybe. We've got to look to Scripture to define church for us. In the end of the day, I, I, want, I want us to think about this question. What kind of church do we need to be in order for these things to happen here at IPC? You know, like, how, how would we more fully enter into these things? What will we have to, to become if, if we're not already? And I do believe m a good chunk of this is already going on among us. But for example, how do we get to a point where we... Um, are able to, as I said last week in the sermon, confess our sins to one another. I want to suggest to you, by the way, that's a deep expression of fellowship, and here's why. Because, you know, we come to another person, and we live, here's the answer to the question, in a church that is just dominated by the beautiful reality of grace. And we can say to another person, I could say to another person, here's my sin, because I know that, well, this is my sin, they have their own. I'm no different than them. And I know when I express my sinfulness to the person that I'm struggling, you know, the sin I'm struggling with and I express it to another, that I'm not going to receive judgment or condemnation. I'm not going to be rejected in any way because of grace. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to get is love because somebody's going to come alongside me and pray for me and provide some accountability maybe and encourage me and, and so forth. That's the kind of church we'd have to be, a grace-filled church where we really embrace that dynamic, and that is then shared life, even the level of sharing sin, which is, it would be a dramatic and a wonderful reality. What would it take for us, my friends, if, if we could get to the place where we are you know, passionately committed 
to helping others who are in need. Uh, where, we, where we actually do know what people's needs are and then we are able to go toward and to bless and to care for that person. <coughs> well, we would need trust because it's only when people trust one another that they're able to share their need and then there has to be the, the powerful and living reality of love among us so that when we hear of need, the l as I said, the last thing that we would do is just leave it alone. We are going to be compelled, the Bible says, to go toward that person, to meet their need of whatever sort it is, but to love them and to care for them and to provide for them because of love. What would it take for us to be a church where we actually are on a regular pa basis inviting people into our homes for a coffee or a meal, just an evening together, and they're doing the same for us? You know, what I think it would be is just our recognition that we're all part of the same family of God, where friendships form, where connections form in people's relationship with one another. And it allows that sort of dynamic to become the norm because these are the people that I do life with, and that's fellowship. Fellowship, again, characterized by love. You know, my friends, uh, it's, it's a bit of an odd thing talking about koinonia <laughs> in the midst of COVID because a lot of this we can't do, right? I mean, I know some life groups are carrying on. We've formed life groups for the sake of fellowship. It's one of the purposes. And I really think that they've enabled us in many ways to live out these dynamics. But we can't do it now. There are people who continue to meet online. I was invited into a, a life group for older people this week, and I really enjoyed it and, and had a good talk. But you know what? I could tell those people loved each other. There was an affection among them. Um, you know, they teased each other and, and so forth. Teased me too. But you know, fellowship, I it's not as easy in COVID, but it can happen, and I would encourage you toward it. But here's my point to you. When we come back post-COVID, whenever that is, I hope it's in the fall, and I'm sure you do too. How will we enter more fully, more deeply, more profoundly into koinonia? How will we function? What will you do to develop this experience, to know this experience, develop these relationships of love among us? My friends, I want to say let's, let's not keep our distance from each other. That's, that's a fellowship killer. Let's do the opposite. Let's deepen relationships. Love, let's love more. Let's be more committed. Let's, let's, let's be together more and engage this commonality that we have, whether it be in worship or in service, in sharing our faith with one another verbally and so forth. You see, what I want to do, what I want to do is to take you back as I finish today to that definition of koinonia. Remember I described it to you a few minutes ago? Two words put together, the Hebrew word meaning shared house. The Greek word which is attached to that, which essentially means uh, uh, that which is common among us, which produces bonding in relationship and closeness. But think about that in the context of a shared house. Who shares a house together? Well, family shares a house together. People who love one another. People who are committed to one another people who care deeply for one another. Uh, I want to say, if you know the Bible at all, you know that w another one of those um, uh, mechanisms that is used to describe the church is that we are family. We just have to live as if we're a family. Loving, caring for, committed to, being together because we want to be. Because we want to be. I guess in the end of the day, I want to say to you that it's highly likely in the lives of most of us, myself included, there is much more for us to enter into if we want to know a deeper understanding and level of fellowship. We, c we can take steps further in. And I want to tell you, if we will do that, it will impact our lives. We will break free from sin, for example. We will have our needs met and we'll be able to meet the needs of other people. We'll know love, we'll know grace, we'll know friendship. We'll have glad and sincere hearts as we're together. You see, what we'll experience in the midst of this family is the beauty of God and his way arising among us. See, he creates the fellowship. He's at the heart of it. We are united in Christ. 
And then we live out that dynamic with one another. And God produces a different thing. At the end of the day, my friends, I want to suggest to you, we need to think about what church is differently. It's not a building, and, and it's, it's not something we do just do on a Sunday morning. That's part of it. It's, it's, not, it's not institutional in the sense of it's some, somehow uh, organized and, 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 and out there beyond me. No, it is us. We are the ecclesia, is the Greek word, those who are called out of the world to come together in unity, in love, in commitment to one another, in fellowship to experience the goodness of God, to be transformed in that place, to be an example to the world as this church was so that others will long to become a part of us as they see the relationship we have with each other and want that too. My friends, I want to tell you, I, don't even, I still don't want to call it fellowship because I think it probably takes you in a different direction, but this thing called koinonia in the Greek, it's God's will for you. It's what needs to form, if you would, the life of our church. It, it needs to be at the heart of who we are. And I invite you, when COVID ends, to come back ready to engage more fully in whatever gateway God has maybe led you even today so that we might be more and more and more the church of Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we all have impressions of what the church is. But today we've looked into this early church, this church which was filled with your spirit immediately after Pentecost and immediately after this incredible sermon that Peter preached uh, where thousands came to, to believe in Jesus and they formed themselves in a way that didn't look at all like what we understand church to be, but Lord, they had, they had love for each other. They had commitment to each other. They, they showed grace to one another. They, they engaged life and faith together because you had united them because they shared a faith in Jesus. And God, our prayer is that we more and more at IPC can be like them, that relationship and, 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 and this commonality that we share in Jesus can be at the heart of who we are. Lord, help us to love like that. Help us to be open and honest like that. Help us to sacrifice for one another like that. Help us to long to share time together. Help form friendships that are deep and profound and meaningful. God, in the end of the day, we pray that you do your work in us through fellowship and that you would allow others to see what's going on among us so that they want some of this too. God, build your church. Build the fellowship that is among us. Help us to go more deeply into it and experience more, pro experience more profoundly what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And this we pray in Christ's name. Blessed assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste Of glory divine Heir of salvation Purchase of God Born of His Spirit Washed in His blood Perfect submission All is at rest I and my Savior Am happy and blessed Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, oh this is my song, praising my day long oh this is my story is this is my song praising my savior all the 
day long Blessed assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste Glory divine Heir of salvation Purchase of God Born of His Spirit Washed in His blood This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long This is my story Oh, this is my song Praising my Savior All the day long He loves us Whoa, how He loves us Whoa, how He loves us Whoa, how He loves He is jealous for me Loves like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me Oh, how He loves us so How He loves us all This is my story This is my song Praising my Savior All the day long This is my story Oh, this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long. Yeah, He loves us. Whoa, how He loves us. Whoa, how He loves us. Whoa, how He loves. Yeah, He loves. Oh, how He loves us Oh, how He loves us Oh, how He loves Well, I want to bless you again in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit that you would know fullness of life in Christ that you would know what it means to be His church in the way of his desire and his design. That you would know the goodness of God as you fellowship together among his people. Amen. Every ocean meets the skyline Every sunset, every sunrise they rise and fall to give you worship Every planet, all the stars They surrender to your heart Oh, they rise and fall to give you worship We are hail the King of Kings
So 